Principles of Microeconomics 2017, Case Study 4, Monopolistic Competition, by Nicholas Papazoglu, Sam Hannigan, and Callum Samballas. The Movements Within the Australian Coffee Market The $4.3 million Australian coffee market is expected to grow by 3.2% over the next five years. According to IBIS World, Research shows that this growth has become apparent from growing consumer demand for independent coffee shops over large coffee chains such as the Coffee Club and Starbucks. Subsequently, chain stores have seen the dilution of its market share where no company owns more than 5% of the coffee market. Smart Company has reported that the growing demand for small coffee specialty cafes has resulted in a highly competitive market with relatively low entry and exit barriers, thus has enabled shops to be firmly established with minimal costs by the advantage of leasing equipment, premises, furniture and fittings. Question 1. The coffee industry is a typical example of monopolistic competition. We know this because the article states a. There is a high level of competition in the industry with low barriers to entry and with each coffee business selling the same type of coffee. b. Low competition, medium barriers, different quality. C. Low competition, high barriers and different quality or D. High competition, low barriers and different quality. Now, in order to answer this question, we must deconstruct the definition of monopolistic competition and analyse its features. Monopolistic competition, a market structure in which many firms sell products that are similar but not identical. To be more precise, monopolistic competition derives the following attributes. Many sellers. There are many firms competing for the same group of customers. Therefore, instantly ruling out B and C, leaving only A and D as our possible answers. Product differentiation. Each firm produces a slightly different product. Rather than being a price taker, each firm faces a downward sloping demand curve. Furthermore, ruling out A, due to its stating, each coffee business selling the same type of coffee. Free entry. In the long run, firms can enter or exit the market without restriction. Finally, by the process of elimination, D ticks all the necessary boxes. Thus, D is a high level of competition in the industry with low barriers to entry and with each coffee business selling coffee that differs in quality. Question 2. The article states that Starbucks had to close out many of its Australian stores as they were unable to compete with the Australian palate. Suppose that an individual coffee supplier was in long-run equilibrium before Starbucks closed its stores. Which of the graphs below would best represent the individual coffee supplier's situation in the short run after Starbucks closed its stores? Assume the individual coffee supplier is profit maximizing. The black lines in the graphs represent the original long-run equilibrium. The red lines represent the short-run impact of Starbucks leaving the coffee industry. Answering this question, we must look at the changes to quantity demanded. The article states that Starbucks exited the Australian coffee market. With a major chain exiting the market, this would force its existing customers to purchase coffee elsewhere. Thus, this would cause both marginal revenue and demand curves to shift to the right. As such, an independent coffee supplier in long run equilibrium would gain a larger share of the coffee market. Its quantity therefore would increase. Furthermore, in answering this question, we must also consider changes to price. Having a large supplier of coffee exit the market would severely decrease the overall supply of coffee. This decrease in market supply will push the supply curve to the left. Therefore, for an individual coffee supplier in long run equilibrium, they will see their price of coffee rise. Thus, as for both the last two slides, we can see that graph C is the correct answer to question two. Question three. In the article, Rob indicates that local operators are able to compete with larger change through the use of value-added offerings such as customer loyalty cards or coffee and meal specials. What degree of price discrimination would you best describe this as? A. First degree. B. Second degree. C. Third degree. Now, to ensure we answer this question, we must understand the definitions behind each degree. First degree. 
Price discrimination, charging the maximum possible price for each unit. Second degree price discrimination, charging a different price for different quantities. Third degree price discrimination, charging a different price to different consumer groups. Therefore, the answer to the question can only be C. Why? As seen, third degree discrimination is linked directly to consumer willingness and ability to pay for a good or service. It means that the prices charged may bear little to no relation to the cost of production. The use of value-added offers, such as consumer loyalty cards or coffee and meal specials, correlate to targeting specific consumer groups. This is demonstrated within meal specials, which can be associated with families seeking the most convenient dinner meal. Meal deals split the market into off-peak and peak times to smooth demand. Also, customer loyalty cards, for example, that target regular and consistent consumers, which in turn pr provide incentive to keep on purchasing until a free unit is re received, demonstrate this point, i.e. early morning work coffees purchased, for example, at Michelle's Patisserie, after the 12th drink purchased, you receive one free coffee. Thus, an effective method in targeting consumer groups to maximize market share and in turn, total sales and market revenue is third degree price discrimination. Further clarifying our answer as C. Thanks Callum. To further elaborate on your point, we must take a look at the elasticity of demand when price discrimination is used. Profit maximization will occur at price and output where MC equals MR. The inelastic market will receive higher profits in the area than the elastic market as the price in the inelastic market is higher than the elastic market. Discrimination is therefore only worth undertaking if the profit from separating the market is greater than keeping the markets combined. This will depend on relative elasticities of demand. Question 4. In the article, Rob indicates that local operators are able to compete with larger chains through the use of value-added offerings as customer loyalty cards or coffee and meal specials. What other types of price discrimination could coffee establishments use? First degree price discrimination, more commonly known as perfect price discrimination, is a situation where monopolists can achieve the maximum willingness to pay for each of its customers, as well as charging different prices to different customers. Therefore, seen in graph B, if successful, companies can remove all deadweight loss due to total surplus derived from the market going towards the producer as profit. However, for a local coffee operator, they do not have information about every customer or enough market power to perfectly discriminate. Second degree price discrimination. Conversely to first degree, producers are unable to differentiate between the willingness to pay of each customer. Producers will use incentives to attract customers with quantity discounts or non-linear pricing through bulk purchases. Using this, the producer would pr place prices according to the groups or subcategories of customers in order to obtain a larger portion of total surplus. For a local coffee operator, price discrimination methods such as bulk purchasing of coffee for office blocks as well as two-for-one deals in cafes. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our case study on monopolistic competition.